We come to listen to uh, the Song of Solomon and be reminded of it, but there are four different passages to be heard this morning from Ecclesiastes, from the Song, from Isaiah, and then from Ephesians. So beginning with Ecclesiastes 12, the last few verses. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. And then the first two verses of the Song of Songs, and then from 8-6. Solomon's Song of Songs. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your love is more delightful than wine. From 8-6. Set me like a seal on your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is strong as death, passion as relentless as Sheol. The flash of it is a flash of fire, a flame of Yahweh himself. From the next book in our canon, Isaiah 1, 1 through 3. The vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, son of Amoz, saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear me, you heavens, listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up. They have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master, the donkey its owner, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. And then from Paul, Ephesians 5, 28 following. In the same way, husbands must love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man to love his wife is for him to love himself. A man never hates his own body, but he feeds it and looks after it. And that is the way Christ treats the church, because we are parts of his body. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and becomes attached to his wife, and the two become one flesh. This mystery has great significance, and I'm applying it to Christ and the church. Please be seated. <clears throat> I was born into a family that owned radio stations, as it so happened that, in fact, we owned one where uh, Brother Stan grew up, Lovington, New Mexico. And then we had two radio stations here in Austin as well. And as I listened to these stations and thought about formats for station, and, and as I also had a radio station for a period of time in St. Petersburg, Russia, I began to think about the nature of radio music, the nature of really singing, and what, uh, why God created us to sing. I mean, it could have been otherwise that we could never sing, but what was it that gave us, uh, he gave us this voice to sing and not just speak in, in monotones with some emphasis every once in a while? And I think part of it is that singing at his heart is the best way to convey love, the expressions of love with poetry. And in fact, when all is said and done, when you look at radio formats, uh, at their core, there are in, in many ways a variation of different descriptions of love. Uh, love true, love, love lost, love misshaped, love, love, love. In fact, there's a, a channel on the satellite radio called Love, Channel 17. And uh, it's one that probably a lot of people listen to because when all is said and done, and especially perhaps the older you grow, uh, those lyrics uh, touch one's heart, and uh, they are meaningful. There's something about song that's just connected with love. And so it's no surprise that the Song of Songs, the most excellent song, the greatest song, is a song of love. Uh, and if you read these, as they're divided for us, eight chapters, you can tell that interchange between the beloved and the lover, and the friends are kind of looking on and sort of goading at times and observing at times and overlooking at times and almost voyeurs at times, the love between this man and this woman. And the love is passionate. There's tension within it. There's teasing within it. The man will speak of the woman from uh, really head to toe and then come back a few chapters later and speak of the woman from sandaled feet, again, back up to head. It is a lovely thing to read, to read and to say out loud. 
And perhaps not a few of us uh, as men, I don't know about women, have perhaps spoken this to our beloveds at one time or another. The scripture provides different context for reading this poem as we hear it as the word of God this morning. There are two contexts that are provided in our canon, the way that the, the book is placed. The book comes after Ecclesiastes and before Isaiah. And as I have read these uh, last verses of Ecclesiastes and first verses of Isaiah, it's put kind of an interesting twist on this, these lyric poems of love. Because Ecclesiastes ends with a rather direct, after the search has taken place, of here's the matter. We've gone through exhaustively our research. We've Googled everything and we experience life to its fullest. Wine, women, and song, and book learning, and all is said and done, and you know the story. Fear God and keep His commandments because this is what life's about. Kind of straightforward. This is what brings life. So we've read that, and all of a sudden we hit Song of Songs. And we're swooped from fearing God to a, to a different realm of our own passions and feelings and emotions toward the other, the opposite sex. And then we're followed again, after we've read these eight chapters of the Song of Songs, to Isaiah, where we're kind of brought up short again. And here we have this prophet who does curious things visually to others, who is married, who has two children with unusual names at least. And here is Isaiah who begins and says that first oracle is not a pleasant one of God's love for his people, and yet expresses in a way God's love for his people, that you've left me. Even animals know their parents, but you don't know me any longer. And so we're kind of swooped, uh, almost whiplashed, from Ecclesiastes to Song of Solomon and then to Isaiah. A second context. We see in the book right before Ecclesiastes, Proverbs. And Proverbs begins, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. And then Ecclesiastes begins, the words of the teacher, son of David, king of Jerusalem. And then the Song of Songs begins, Solomon's Song of Songs. So we're put into a context of Solomon. And we think about Solomon, and we think about his search, his wisdom, and then we think about Proverbs, we think about the whole of Ecclesiastes and not just the end, and then we think of Song of Songs as it's prefaced with Solomon, and in the midst of it, it mentions Solomon's group of soldiers and so forth who bring him forth in the couch in sort of, of a processional. So Solomon is kind of in our mind, and then we look back at Proverbs, and we think about how is love portrayed, or the opposite sex, from the male perspective, portrayed? And in Proverbs, what is that view of the opposite sex? Well, there's a certain danger. And the young man is, is warned of dame folly, as opposed to lady wisdom. And the allure and entrapment of folly, as opposed to lady wisdom. And then, at the very end, there is this beautiful him, praise of the wife. Uh, not so much for beauty. In fact, it says at the end, charm is deceitful and beauty is fleeting, but a, a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. She's praised for her care for her family, from her wisdom in business to her preparation of food and clothing. And she is to be praised by her children and by her husband to the highest. But it seems to be more adult than that early... Uh, churning of the emotions when the man first saw this woman who became such an honorable wife as she grew and took care of her family. So Proverbs is sort of a little bit ambiguous. It doesn't so much dwell on that initial goodness of, of that allurement. And then Ecclesiastes, what do we find there? Well, it's not all good news. I find more bitter than death the woman who is a snare whose heart is a trap and whose hands are chains. The man who pleases God will escape her. Or enjoy life with your wife, whom you have, 
all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun, all your meaningless days. But then it begins to end, returning to the youth. You who are young, be happy while you are young, and let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth as almost to provide us an entry into the joy of that attraction to that woman of your youth, which then follows in Song of Solomon. So interesting context, we look at it in terms of Solomon and the two previous books that we have in our Christian canon. But of course, uh, a third context is the one which probably has set the agenda for the chapels of recent months, and that is that Song of Solomon comes first in what is called the Five Scrolls. And it's uh, sandwiched in between Job and, and Ruth. But perhaps more interesting is that these five scrolls, as you've heard this semester, are related to feast. And of all things, perhaps planned this way, Song of Solomon is, it, at least at certain point in Judaism, the scroll that was to be read at the Passover. Of all things, I thought about this yesterday in our assemblies that perhaps we should read Song of Solomon at the Lord's table. It would have probably been uh, unique in all of the congregations in Austin to do that at that moment <laughs> that looked at the, observed the Lord's Supper. But it would be a, a, a healthy thing to do. And the reason it was done was that it spoke of God's love, which was true for the Exodus and actually true for Exodus 20, for the giving of the commandments. It wasn't something that a capricious God kind of wanted to put his thumb over us and kind of make us obey him. It wasn't those motivations that led God to redeem us from slavery or to give us the ten words. It was for his great love for us. And so we began to enter into a third, by this having been placed in Judaism this way, a third context for reading the Song of Solomon. And that is it, it really begins to tell us about God's love for us. Uh, and for his people Israel. And then there's a fourth context. And all of course these contexts have been expressed in the early church and later church. And it's one that I think is meaningful and it's, it, it repre it's represented in the fourth reading that we had. And that is from Ephesians chapter 5. Actually in the Greek translation of the Song of Solomon, uh, which is available uh, if you don't read Greek and English translation, a number of times in the Greek translation, the attraction of the man for the woman or more of the woman for the man is expressed in terms of my neighbor, plesion. Some will translate that mate, perhaps, or companion, but it's the word that we have for neighbor. And it reminds us of uh, that second great commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, which some have pointed out in Ephesians 5 is sort of uh, an aspect of love for spouse. It's, it's an interesting aspect of love of neighbor, to love spouse as you love yourself, to love neighbor and your beloved is your closest neighbor, and to love that neighbor, your spouse, as yourself, as your own body. Those words are picked up, in fact, by Paul in Ephesians. To love your self, love your own flesh, to love your beloved, to love your wife. There's also that sense, though, of flesh as it comes from Genesis 2, which Paul quotes, about the man leaving his father and mother and cleaving to his wife, and they become one flesh. Again, the passage from Genesis that follows that aha moment of Adam when he sees that this woman is bone of my bone, you know, flesh of my flesh, and he's struck uh, in, in ways that we can imagine by seeing her. This attraction, then Paul says, this oneness, Paul says is a mystery. And indeed it is. Because we wonder why did God begin creation with creating two? Male and female. Man and woman from man. What was there that was being signaled or planned within God's economy that would lead him to have two rather than just one or perhaps three or four. I mean, the 
We say the Trinity is three. Why weren't there three rather than two? It's almost as if there's some, there's some hint here that perhaps the very creation of man and woman had a larger purpose in God's own mind that those who experience that, who experience that intimacy, can have in a way that you cannot have otherwise a sense of proximity, of oneness, of the expression of just being outside yourself but completed in that oneness that approximates the best we can in this life what God's intended before creation in knowing already about Christ and the church. That there's something about the experience of male and female that is an approximation, a preview, an intimation of what God has in mind for Christ and the church. Well, we have to kind of leave that as mystery. And at the Song of Solomon, and read it this afternoon, in its expression, in its tensions, in the release of tensions, in the expression of going to the garden again, of being in the garden, unlocking the garden, experiencing the oneness, experiencing the beauty of sight, comparing what you see to things that are vibrant to your senses and your imagination, the smells that you have of the perfume, the myrrh, the frankincense, the sight, the smell, the sound, the imagination. All these things can still excite us no matter what our age is. And if they in fact speak of God's love for us, which they do, then it's rich indeed. And if our own experience of male and female becoming one and the passion and feeling for the other is our experience, then it may very well be that we have a little glimpse, fleeting though it might be, of what God had in mind and has in mind and had in mind before creation for Christ and the church. For sure Paul makes no bones about Christ's love for the church, his sacrifice for the church, his giving his life for the church, his love for the church, and expresses that in the same context with talking about male and female husband and wife. So today, there are a number of contexts provided by the canon, by the use of the Song of Songs in Judaism, and even, I think, by Paul, that would give us a richer aspect for understanding the Song of Solomon, a rich aspect for understanding the Song of Solomon. But it doesn't exclude our having read it. And it would be actually wonderful, and perhaps it might have been better this, this day to have broken up into parts and for women to read one part and for men to read the other part and for us to read the chorus or the friends all speaking. But in lieu of doing that, do it on your own this afternoon or tonight. Or if you have a, a spouse, do it with the spouse tonight. And think of it in terms of what love he has given us. And even in fact in chapter 8 as we close to read this again, set me like a seal on your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is strong as death, passion as relentless as Sheol. The flash of it is a flash of fire. And as some translations render this, a flame of Yahweh himself.